Attention, naval officers and men detached or discharged. You may resume your status or you may re-enlist in the training program of the Naval Reserve by calling at the Armory, 1st Avenue at 52nd Street, any night between 8 and 10 during the month of April. Now, story behind the headlines brought to you over WEAF, NBC in New York. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In these analyses, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. At the end of this first peacetime Easter, it seems that the conscience of the American people has been thoroughly aroused, thanks to the stirring appeals of President Truman, Mr. Hoover, Mr. LaGuardia, and others. This means new hope for the starving millions of Europe and Asia. The danger of mass starvation is by no means past, and there is no certainty that it will be averted unless every one of us does his part. That, as Mr. LaGuardia says, will give this Easter a new significance. The contribution of Congress to the Easter festivities is the emasculation of price control. On Wednesday, the House voted 355 to 42 for the continuation of the OPA for nine months only, not as an effective body, but as a mere ghost. If this bill were approved by the Senate, the OPA, according to Paul Porter, its chief, would become completely ineffective and impossible to administer. The Gossett Knee Control Amendment, he said, would force the OPA to remove ceilings on at least half of the articles which make up our cost of living. The Workage Cost Plus Reasonable Profit Amendment would blow sky high the prices on that new car, refrigerator, or radio you've been waiting to buy, as well as on most of the household appliances that nearly every housewife has been dreaming of for years. Above all, the mangling of the OPA bill will add billions of dollars to Uncle Sam's food bill and seriously jeopardize the entire stabilization program. The ordinary citizen has a right to be bewildered. How can the representatives he has elected deliberately set out to remove controls which have, when all is said and done, kept prices within a reasonable limit and have, therefore, made living possible for the man with a fixed moderate income? The obvious answer, of course, is that Congress does not represent only the man with a fixed moderate income who wants to buy. It represents also a huge number of people who have something to sell. It represents the farmer who wants to get the highest possible price for his crop. It represents the hundreds of thousands of small dealers and businessmen who want to make as big a, as big a percentage on the things they sell in the wholesale and retail trade. And it also represents big industrial and financial interests which hope to make a killing at a time when billions of accumulated savings are waiting to be spent. The stock market has been going up and up in anticipation of the fabulous profits that industry expects to make and in which a large number of people hope to share. In short, Congress has a boom mentality to deal with as well as the business interests with their great lobbies and their pressure advertising financed by millions of accumulated profits. So in the last analysis, it is not Congress alone that is to blame. It is the vast number of people who take a short-term view of the future, who think that if business is good, things can't be bad for them. It has also to deal with the well-known impatience of the typical American who wants what he wants when he wants it, and with those people who have been persuaded that the OPA is responsible for shortages in black markets. You might as well believe that umbrellas are responsible for rain. Now, everybody likes the idea of getting more money for the goods or the services he has to sell. But here is the catch. Money is worth only as much as it buys. And as prices rise, your money actually decreases in value. The buying power of the dollar you have today is certainly somewhat less than the dollar you had in 1941. That is due to such rise in prices as there has been. Imagine how little your dollar would be worth if prices were permitted to rise to whatever the traffic will bear. That is what inflation consists of, high prices. We had inflation after the last war, not only in Europe, but right here. This is what happened in 1919, there being no retail price control. 
There was plenty of money in the hands of business, just as today, and lots of money in the hands of prospective buyers, just as today. Wild speculation seized both stock and commodity markets, manufacturing and trade. Businessmen bought everything they could lay hands on, expecting to profit by the rise in prices, and this made prices rise still more. During the first year after the war, business inventories increased by $6 billion, more than four times the average post-war rise. One-third of that rise was due to soaring prices. The cost of living, already 50% above pre-war level, rose to 77% above, and in 1920, it more than doubled again. In other words, in 1920, we paid over two and a half times as much for the necessities of life as we paid in 1914. I heard it said by a commentator that price control never really worked. Well, with all the faults of our particular machinery, if it hadn't worked during these past three years, we would obviously now be where we were in 1919 and 20, or worse. In 1920, the stock market continued to boom right through to November when President Harding, the apostle of normalcy, was elected by an overwhelming majority. Then came the crash. Average wholesale prices fell from 227.9 in 1920 to 150.6 in 1921. In the end, 450,000 farmers lost their farms. There were over 100,000 business bankruptcies in the United States. What happened to the average employee, the white-collar worker, the man with a fixed salary who couldn't even strike for higher wages, too many of us remember only too well. Curiously enough, however, the large corporations suffered little by comparison with the general decline. And that may be one reason why big business today is rooting for a little inflation, for putting money to work, and for stopping price control. But the labor unions lost over a million members within two years largely because they couldn't afford to pay the dues. Today, labor unions have four times as many members, and they are far more powerful. It is not likely that labor would suffer prices to rise without demanding a corresponding rise in wages, and the inflationary spiral would start its dizzy spin. I have seen that familiar phenomenon at close range in Europe after the last war. Hardly a single country escaped it, and everywhere it meant devaluation of the currency. In England, I bought the $5 pound for $3.50. In France, the franc was marked down to one-fifth its value. In Germany, the mark practically disappeared, and people dealt only in valueless paper millions and billions. The middle class, the most stable in the country, was financially ruined. In desperation, these people joined the Nazi ranks. Inflation, more than any other single factor, was responsible for Hitler's success. Here in America, we managed to climb out of our post-war slump after two terrible years, through a belated building boom, through the development of new industries and the financing of prodigious war export trade, supported by an enormous world demand for our goods. But prosperity didn't last, and by the end of the 20s, the export trade collapsed. Foreign countries, having gone through the inflation ringer, and stopped by high American tariff walls, could no longer afford to buy our goods, nor did they have the dollars with which to repay our loans, or even the interest on our loans. So we had the catastrophic depression of the 30s, accompanied by the rumors and alarms of war. That is the story of the chain of events which began with the inflation following World War I. This time, it is true, we have had some more or less effective controls but the pressure of unused buying power against the available goods is many times greater than last time. And when the dam bursts, we can expect nothing short of a ruinous flood. This time, moreover, the area of foreign buying power is tremendously reduced because of the vastly greater devastation of this war. This time, unless we finance our foreign trade with government loans, since private loans to our old allies are impossible under the Johnson Act, there may be no foreign trade to speak of. People back in 1920 did not generally understand the terrible economic forces which threatened our security and our very homes and the liberties of the peoples of the world. But in 1944, they knew that President Roosevelt was right when he said that people who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. Besides, 
Large numbers of people today are economically informed. Many of them remember the effects of non-control after the First World War. People are as conscious as ever of their sectional and occupational interests, but they're also conscious of their interests as consumers. The returning veteran who has been fighting to save the American way of life is going to look twice at legislation that raises its cost. Today, the housewife knows what the OPA means to her budget, and she knows how to exercise her vote. It is no wonder, therefore, that according to public opinion polls, from 73 to 83 percent of the people are for continuing the OPA. Then what, you may ask, is Congress doing? This, after all, is the election year. Well, perhaps Congressmen feel that this is not a party matter, since people on either side of the House were for and against. In any case, it's all part of the conservative revolt against the more progressive policies of the Truman administration. The opposition, frankly, does not like President Truman's continuation of Roosevelt policies, which many people hope to see buried with the outbreak of war, with the end of war. In his annual message to Congress in 1944, President Roosevelt projected what he called an economic bill of rights. In this, he included the right to work, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right to a decent home for every family, to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment. All of these rights, he said, spell security. And, he said, unless there is security at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. President Truman, in his first peacetime message to Congress, carried forward the Roosevelt program and asked for definite legislation from the present Congress. This included, one, a full employment bill, two, a fair employment practices bill, three, a bill to provide additional unemployment benefit for discharged veterans and war workers, four, a federal housing bill ensuring low-cost housing, five, a minimum wage bill raising the floor under wages gradually to 75 cents an hour, and six, the extension of OPA. Let's see what's happened to date. The full employment bill was whittled down to an almost meaningless planning program. The unemployment compensation bill was passed by the Senate, but shelved in a House committee. The fair employment practices bill was talked to death in the Senate in a 22-day filibuster. The Patman housing bill was passed in emasculated form by both houses, with no price ceilings on houses already built. The minimum wage bill was passed in the Senate after being whittled down to 60 cents an hour with no future increases assured. Also, a rider was attached permitting a rise in farm parity prices which would force the President to veto the bill. As for the OPA, you already know what the House did. The Senate may yet take pity on the poor consumer provided sufficient outcry is raised. It would be wrong to say that it's all Congress's fault. No doubt the administration has made mistakes. Perhaps the fatal error, from the point of view of Congress, was the wage price policy, permitting rises in wages and corresponding rises in prices before production had got into its stride to meet the post-war demand. The rise in wages was difficult to refuse, however, with strikes threatening to tie up all industry. The rise in the price of steel opened the way for price rises all round, and the OPA was already in difficulties as a result. But if the administration program was not acceptable, it was up to Congress to find a substitute. Congress did nothing. 1946, said President Truman, is the year of decision. This year, he said, we lay the foundation of our economic stature, which will have to last for generations. There is mighty little time left for Congress to act. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations have presented the story behind the headlines. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.